Hello, folks. Uh, today we are talking with uh, Dr. Michael Benton, PhD. Um, he is a vertebrate paleontologist and a professor at the University of Bristol in England. He has authored uh, uh, numerous books, including the one that uh, we were talking off air about off air, uh, Dinosaurs Rediscovered. Uh, that was 2018, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yes, that one. Okay. So. Today we're going to be talking about Triassic dinosaurs, the earliest stages of evolution of the dinosaurs, and we're going to be also be talking about mass extinctions and how we can uh, look at our current world and see uh, uh, and look at the keys in the past and see how we can relate to it in the future or in the present. So, uh, thanks so much, Dr. Benton, for being with us today. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure. All right, so let's get right into it. Uh, so how did dinosaurs arise? Because um, there are, in the Triassic, there are, several there are several individual dinosaurs, correct? But then there are also yep. dinosaur morphs. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the pre-Triassic conditions, the Permian. Uh, what led up to the rise of the dinosaurs? Yeah, yeah. So... Um... The oldest dinosaur fossils that we know for sure are late Triassic, particularly from the Ischugalasta formation of Argentina, dated maybe about 230 million years ago. But actually, we know they originated much sooner than that. Um, and the, we need to know that there was a big mass extinction event at the end of the Permian at 252 million years ago. So your question is very relevant because, in fact, I think now the evidence suggests that the rise of the dinosaurs is part of the recovery of life after that big devastating mass extinction. So we have to imagine a scene in the late Permian with no dinosaurs, with um, a, a, a variety of um, small to large kinds of reptiles. Most of them are belong to two groups called the synapsids and the parareptiles. The synapsids were traditionally called the mammal-like reptiles, and some of those were uh, quite large. There, there were giant plant eaters, some of which may have weighed maybe half a ton. And um, there were also some small and quite large um, parareptiles, the most famous being the pariasaurs, which were big bulky things with quite short legs and big kind of warty heads or not very big, but covered in scales and all kinds of stuff. And you can study these particularly in um, South Africa and in Russia, uh, where I've worked in both, and in China as well, in North China. And so we have quite a good knowledge of diverse uh, faunas. The landscape was full of life. Um, everything was fine. We, in fact, have the first quite diverse terrestrial faunas with a full range of herbivores and everything was looking good. And then along comes the mass extinction event 252 million years ago, marking the end of the Permian period. And that's, as far as we know, driven by volcanic eruptions and consequent global warming, acid rain, blah, blah, blah. And uh, huge numbers of, huge proportions of life died out, maybe as much as 90% of species, the biggest extinction event of all time. And when I started looking at this, um, most of the vertebrate paleontologists would have said, nah, you know, if this event happened, it was just in the oceans and it had nothing to do with vertebrates. Wrong. It had a big effect because the key, um, all the key groups that were there in the late Permian kind of disappeared. Some of them survived and came back again, the dicynodonts amongst synapsids. But the other thing we know was that there were dinosaurs in the early Triassic. So the early Triassic is about 5 million years in length. This was the time when life was recovering. And we have to, we have to bear in mind that this was not a time of a uh, happy earth. The earth was not happy at all. And in fact, for those five or 6 million years, there were repeated blows, repeated eruptions or other causes with uh, marked by major carbon oxygen isotope perturbation, indicating repeated warming, repeated acid rain, all the kind of bad stuff. And so life would kind of begin to recover and then it would be hit again, begin, hit. So it took about six or seven million years into the Triassic before all of that stuff finished and, and life got going properly. 
How do we know there were dinosaurs right there in the early Triassic, even though we have no fossils uh, for maybe 20 million years after that? The fact is that there were close sister groups of dinosaurs present right down there. And so if we think of a typical evolutionary tree, you've got your dinosaurs, you've got the sister group, which are the Silesaurids. And we know there are Silesaurids from the beginning of the middle Triassic. The dinosaurs are much younger, but because they are sister groups, they share an ancestor. Therefore, we know there is a long ghost range missing data. And so there is, there is other evidence. There is a possible dinosaur from the uh, Middle Triassic of um, Africa. There are lots of little footprints in different parts of the world in the early Triassic and Middle Triassic, little three-toed footprints like dinosaurs or dinosauromorphs. So that's the first thing. And then for some reason, dinosaurs remain really, really rare. And we just don't find them until more or less the Ischigolasto formation of Argentina and age equivalent units. Um, I think we see several steps of evolution of dinosaur-like characters. So um, when people started uh, in the 1980s trying to draw cladograms of dinosaurs in the early forms, uh, we were trying to um, establish what are the unique features of dinosaurs. And um, at that point, people were not even agreed that dinosauria was a clade. So people, the, the common view was still often the case that maybe ornithischians and sauropodomorphs and theropods had sort of independent origins. But it turns out there are a bunch of features that all dinosaurs share, mainly to do with the hind limb and mainly to do with the upright posture. So just like us, dinosaurs stood upright, not like a, a sprawling lizard, right. as the, most people know. And they orient, reorient, and they were bipeds. <clears throat> and so the reorientation of the hind limb had big effects on the pelvis, the knee, and the ankle. And particularly in the ankle region, they were becoming um, digitigrade, which means uh, dinosaurs are up on their tippy toes, just like a horse or a dog, not plantigrade like us. We put our whole foot on the ground. And so in becoming digitigrade and upright, the, the nature of those joints becomes much simpler. Uh, because if you're a sprawling lizard, you have to be able to bend your knee or elbow and your wrist or uh, ankle in particular ways as you walk along in the hand and foot chain. Whereas if you're walking like we do, your, your, your limbs are kind of straight, they're just kind of hinge joints. And so, and also going up on the tiptoes, but we now know there is a group called Aphanosaurians, which um, Sterling Nesbitt and others described uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago. And they are, they're early to middle Triassic. They're in the dinosaur side of the tree, the Avimetatarsalians. And they have these, they have these bird-like elongate ankle bones, but they have the feet flat on the ground. They're quadrupeds and they're plantigrade. And as you step up through some of the um, dinosauromorphs like Silosaurids, maybe uh, Lagerpetids and various other little things, they look very dinosaur-like, but they may lack certain dinosaur features of the pelvis. Perhaps the perforated acetabulum is a dinosaur right. feature, maybe not. But, you know, we just see now there's a much stronger fossil record. We've got a lot of these stages. And in fact, certain characters that we thought in the 1980s were unique to dinosaurs have now gone back down the cladogram because of the discovery of these uh, uh, fossils or proper description of these fossils. Mm -hmm. Right. Somebody said in the, in the comments, they said that they couldn't hear my question. Uh, basically, I asked what were, what were some of the characteristics that deviate dinosaur morphs from dinosaurs, and that's where you answered. Um, so there you go. Um, so the perforated acetabulum, are, do animals like um, Postosuchus, do they have that feature or is that uh, absent? In So it's the question about Postosuchus and some of those other Rarosuchian type right. reptiles. They're on the other side of uh, Archosaurian evolution. So somewhere in the earliest Triassic, it seems that Archosaurs split 
Uh, and there's one branch going off to birds, the other branch is off to crocodiles, the avimetatarsalians, the pseudosuchia, a variety of other names that people sometimes give. And uh, the, the, the rausuchians, postosuchas, a number of those other creatures, they're on the crocodile side. They do show some paralleling of the, the upright posture. So it seems that during the dry tetrapods, so the surviving synapsids included a few reasonably large forms, but they were mainly getting smaller on the way to mammals, whereas the archosaurs on the whole were kind of getting bigger. Um, but pretty much all these tetrapods in the Triassic seem to have had the so-called erect or upright posture, whether they were quadrupeds or bipeds, they were moving the limbs in under the body. And we see that in the skeletons and in the footprints. So most of the footprints of Triassic, so in the Permian, the trackways are kind of well spaced out, whichever beast is making them. Mm -hmm. in, the per, in the Triassic, they're mainly left, right, left, right, more or less in a straight line or very close. More like dinosaurs. Them. Yeah, and so dinosaurs were part of that. But it seems that, whereas at one time people thought, oh yeah, dinosaurs, they were unique in that. Actually, it seems most of the Triassic tetrapods already had this erect posture. And I think this is all to do with the fact that they were all in some form or another endothermic, warm-blooded. Uh, you, you know, both the mammal line and the bird line, I think. They acquired their endothermy and their upright posture pretty much at this revolutionary time at the beginning of the Triassic. Right. So uh, does the perforated acetabulum, uh, are there specific uh, bones in the hips that allow for that movement, you know, from right, left, right, left? Um. I'm not sure that that's exactly connected. I don't think it's needed um, okay. because, but I believe it is, you know, the, 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 the two key characters of dinosauria are probably the perforated acetabulum and possibly an increase in the number of sacral vertebrae. But as most people know, Ererosaurus and a number of other dinosaurs still retain the two vertebrae and the sacrum. And so it's been quite difficult to you know, people think they've discovered this is the key feature that discriminates dinosauria from everything else. Um, <clears throat> and then it gets a bit slippery. And some would even include silosaurids in dinosauria or some silosaurids. So it is getting quite tricky around there in a way, the more fossils we discover, the more we discover that the point of origin of dinosauria was not necessarily greeted with uh, fanfares and trumpets. This is, a, the, this is the wonderful new mode of life. And here are these amazing creatures. There's a whole bunch of dinosauromorphs, as you mentioned, that are so close. And so the dividing line is, is probably quite narrow. Right, right. Uh, so let's fast forward a couple million years and let's go to the Triassic, okay? Uh, so this, uh, actually, let's cover between. So Permian and Triassic, there's an extinction between there, correct? Yeah. Uh, what was that like? Was there a lot of volcanic activity, earthquakes, a lot of that? So I already, I already mentioned the, the extinction two, five, two million years ago between Permian and Triassic. And um, yep, all, all the evidence we have is that this was driven by massive volcanic eruption in Russia. The so-called Siberian traps, uh, which are basalt rock uh, making up enormous thicknesses and covering a huge area of, of um, Siberia, so Eastern Russia. And um, people have calculated the, the scale of the event. It may have happened in pulses, not just a single eruption, but pulses of eruptions happening repeatedly. And some of them were kind of of local scale, <clears throat> but others were so huge that they had a global impact. And that impact is not so much through the lava, coming out, but more to do with the gases coming out at the yeah. same time. And so typically in a volcanic eruption, you get um, uh, 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 you get high, you, you get um, sulfates and carbon dioxide and, and methane and, and water vapor. Some the sulfides give cooling, but the others give warming. And the longer lasting gases that hang about in the atmosphere are the, the, the global warming gases. So and there's good independent evidence from almost every Permian-Triassic section that people have looked at across the world. You can use oxygen and carbon isotopes measured in the rocks to give you a sort of wiggle of values all the way up through a rock section. 
And these show big spikes just at the PT boundary where the extinction is happening and indicating global warming to the tune of maybe five to 10 degrees C. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, they were, the, these spikes were repeated three or four times during the early uh, Triassic. So probably, we don't know for sure, but probably it was all driven by uh, eruptions of the Siberian traps continuing. And at each point of a, a carbon spike, there is a massive burst of eruption, huge amount of gases, global warming, creating that rise in temperature. But at the same time, those gases are generating acid rain as well. Because if you mix uh, um, sulfates and, and, and um, uh, carbon dioxide and so on with water, you get sulfuric acid. This is battery acid. So acid rain is happening. And, and it's the same processes that we see today, of course. But it's human produced today. At that time, it was a massive volcanic eruption. Right. And we'll get back to like the restoration of the earth uh, after, uh, after when we get into like um, our, our modern crisis and everything. But before we do that, let's talk about the Triassic dinosaurs. What was, there was not much unique about them. There, there were, they're very similar to the dinosaur morphs, just have more dinosaur-like features. Um, we yep. covered this a little bit, but let's cover it a little bit more because I think that um, Herrerasaurus and Neoraptor are particularly interesting. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure what's your question. Um, so uh, basically, what was the determining factor that led to us realizing that Herrerasaurus and Neoraptor were unique and not that they were just another dinosaur morph? Oh, um, I guess they, um, yeah, I guess when they were described, um, uh, uh, we didn't know quite so many dinosaur morphs. They were described as dinosaurs. They're from the Ischogalasto formation, which has already yielded a, a, a number of other dinosaurs. They were, in, Rarasaurus was one of the first to be identified uh, back in the 60s. Uh, now fantastic new specimens have been found. I can't talk specifically about them because I've not studied them, but I think you've presumably asked uh, Paul Serino about those. Correct. He's had a lot of experience with those um, and I've got not very much to add. It's very interesting though, that when you try to draw the cladogram of um, basal dinosaurs to try to pinpoint where dinosaurs originate, what's a dinosaur or morph, what's a dinosaur, um, but also the splitting of the different clades because one view we had which may or may not be correct, is that those sorts of dinosaurs are maybe Sauriscians, but they cannot be readily placed into Theropoda or Sauropodomorpha, um, whereas others would place them at the base of one or other, Eoraptor certainly at the base of Sauropodomorpha. And that's actually highlighted that, um, if that's correct, that we see the Sauropodomorpha as generally quite large to very large plant eaters, um, but then, as you'd expect, the very early forms are either carnivores or omnivores. So um, we need to get used to that fact that some of these Triassic sauropodomorphs were generalists or, or carnivores. And um, it's only in, in larger forms that they became, and, and later perhaps, that they became definitively herbivorous. All right. So I, I particularly like studying more latter Cretaceous dinosaurs, like the evolution from theropods to modern birds. And that's what I find interesting. Uh, that's what I study the most. Uh, I know that you're more involved in mass extinctions, Triassic dinosaurs, so I don't know too much, but this is why I have these sort of talks, so I can learn, and I like learning. So, um, is... Um, what about Pladiosaurus? Like, uh, is, that a, is that a dinosaur? Because I asked Dr. Paul Serino if Eoraptor was a dinosaur morph, and uh, he said, no, it's a dinosaur. And, I, and I'm like, okay, my whole world is turned upside down because I was told that Eoraptor was a dinosaur morph. I don't know why. Well, well, but it's, well, it's, it's a dinosaur. All dinosaurs are dinosaur morphs because dinosaur mm, morph uh, is the bigger clade and dinosauria fits within the clade. But... Um, yeah, definitely a raptor is a, is a dinosaur. Platyosaurus, of course, Platyosaurus is a dinosaur, it's a sauropodomorph. I think Platyosaurus is very important because it's the first truly huge dinosaur. Um, because up to that point, uh, most of the dinosaurs were um, just a few meters in, one meter to a, two or three meters in length. 
and Plesiosaurus could be maybe five to 10 meters. So it was the first truly huge dinosaur. Uh, and the best specimens are known from the late Triassic of Germany and areas around Germany. Uh, and they became, they were truly uh, 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 abundant. Um, so that there are certain localities in Germany where you can find, or there have been found tens or even hundreds of specimens. So. Uh, Plateosaurus was living, I don't know, from 220 million years ago, something like that, through to about 201. It, it spanned through much of the late Triassic. Um, and where it's found in Germany in particular, Switzerland, Central Europe, um, it, was, it, it was a new, it was representing a new kind of ecosystem. It was part of a new kind of ecosystem because up to that point, dinosaurs had remained relatively uh, small in numbers, small in size. And after that point, they became uh, hugely abundant in many cases and um, uh, uh, very large. And so this was, this, this was the first phase of the expansion of dinosaurs. And I think that part of dinosaur history in the late Triassic, dating from about 233 to about 201, million years ago, that was one chunk of history. And then it all changed again uh, in the early Jurassic because there was another extinction event. So we're, we're punctuating the history of dinosaurs by one, two, three, at least four mass extinction events. I mean, 252 kicked it all off. Uh, the whole world changed. You, you get a kind of quickening of life. You get erect posture, you get dinosaurs, you get mammals. Then there is, of course, we've not talked about uh, the um, Carnian pluvial event, which has been studied for a number of years, and we published a big review paper about this last week. Uh, the Carnian pluvial event is about 233 to 232 million years ago. Before that, we don't find dinosaurs. After that, we do find dinosaurs. And within about 10 million years, you get abundant and large dinosaurs. Then at 201 is the end Triassic mass extinction that wiped out various um, carnivores and other groups and kind of gave uh, the carnivorous dinosaurs the chance to get truly large and, and the whole community, the whole ecosystem is, is dominated by dinosaurs. And then of course the fourth extinction event is the end of the Cretaceous and the end of the dinosaurs. Right, so let's talk about that end Triassic extinction. Was that very similar to the Permian uh, extinction that led up to the Triassic? No, in almost no way at all. Um, because the, the Permian event uh, at least is driven by a volcanic eruption, as is the Carnian pluvial event, as is the end Triassic event. So those three critical mass extinctions through the Triassic were all driven by volcanic eruptions, and they shared a similar model of um, global warming and um, acid rain. And they may have had multiple phases, not just a single like one day, one hellish day. <laughs> they're maybe lasting for a while and then you have a gap and then maybe a few tens of thousands of years later you get another uh, eruption etc cetera, etc cetera. so of course the the end cretaceous mass extinction was um was the result of an asteroid impact it truly was a day from hell and the asteroid hits it very quickly throws up a dust cloud blacks out the sun you get freezing of course, in the area around the Caribbean where the, the impact took place, you have immediate physical impact in terms of tsunami waves destroying the coastlines all around Mexico and uh, the southern United States. Um, but that effect is kind of short lived, whereas the, 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 the dust that is lofted by the impact is, lo is a long lived effect, but long lived only in, in terms of like a year. And um, the, there was so much dust thrown up that it blacked out the sun. If you've got no sunlight, photosynthesis stops, the plants die. But probably more importantly, you get kind of freezing cold. And this is kind of worldwide, or at least the Northern Hemisphere, uh, uh, which is where the, the impact took place. And um, that, that, that just caused a tremendous hiatus in the history of life. Um, but recovery is quite quick, you know, so life had begun to recover after the impact within 100,000 years, life was recovering. And um, in many settings, it had almost completely recovered. And that was it. Whereas it took maybe seven or 8 million years for life to recover from the end Permian event, 
uh, it only took a few hundred thousand for life to recover from the end Triassic. So it was pretty grim at the time. Dinosaurs went, there were maybe teetering on the brink anyway. Uh, you know, would they have survived to the present day with climate changes? Probably not, because global climate is much cooler than it was uh, now. Uh, and they would have probably, uh, you know, they would have probably um, disappeared at some point. Anyway. Did that, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Did that extinction event leave something in the ground, like the KPG extinction, like some sort of clay boundary as well, or was it more like? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, obviously the end, end Cretaceous. That's when you get the iridium layer, and right. um, so the iridium itself is a marker. It doesn't really do any killing. It's just mm -hmm. a platinum group element, so it doesn't right. poison right. things. I don't think, but it's a marker that is a very good indicator that it was a single impact. It, it spread the dust cloud around the earth because you find it in both marine successions. So the whole earth was surrounded and the dust kind of fell out, settled on the surface of the ocean, settled all over the land. <clears throat> and it forms a very nice blanket that, that, that just marks a single instant in, in time. So yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, so we're almost approaching to the end of our time. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how we can look at the past and we can uh, tell the future uh, as, you know, you gave a TED talk. Um, I'm not sure when it was, um, but you said that you could look in that we as geologists, paleontologists could look in the past and tell characteristics in the future of what crisis, what crisis is could, uh, could potentially occur and could end life on earth as we know it. Um, yeah. yeah. So, what are some of the characteristics of today that the that was shared in the past that led up to a big, big crisis? Yeah, I think it's a, a good point that geologists and paleontologists should stress. We can actually contribute to this discussion, not just in the sense of saying, oh, the dinosaurs died out, that's very sad. Um, right. And even the extinction of the dinosaurs, that event isn't enormously helpful for understanding what's happening right now. I know there's been discussion that the Earth can be hit by an asteroid any time, and that might happen. And we can either read that in terms of if you should wear a hard hat and kind of hope you don't get hit on the head. Or in Ronald Reagan terms, you can invent great space weapons that will nuke the asteroid before it comes near to the Earth. Well. Yeah, I don't know. Good, good luck. You know, maybe that will work. I can't say. Sounds a bit crazy. Um, but I think actually the, the other events like the end Permian, like the Carnian, like the end Triassic, because they are, although they're driven by volcanic eruptions, the key points are global warming and acid rain. And acid rain is associated with ocean acidification as well. So the, the, the warmth, the, the heating and the acidification are really important. <clears throat> and we can in the present day, in the last hundred years, we know that temperatures have gone up. So we're seeing global warming on a smaller scale, of course, than these crises in the past, but already people are talking about like a one degree, two degree rise. Uh, these big events are maybe like six degrees, ten, five degrees, 10 degrees. Um, and of course, we're worried about ocean acidification is happening. And we're worried right. about acid rain is kind of happening. And we know these kill stuff. You can see them killing the reefs, killing the forests. There's no argument, you know, that's just right there in front of you. Uh, and so the benefit of looking at these ancient events is they already happened. In science, we think of repeating experiments. When you do chemistry experiments, you can repeat it, it'll give the same result and repeat it again. Somebody else can do it. We can't really run experiments in global warming and ocean acidification because it would be kind of unethical. Who would agree to say, OK, we can crank up the temperature of the Earth by five degrees and let's see what would happen. I don't know how you would do it, actually, as an experiment. These things have happened in the past. And the great thing, the great take home, I think, is that uh, whereas maybe 20 or 30 years ago, what we would say would be hedged with a lot of uh, big error bars. We'd be saying, well, we don't know for sure, but maybe this is what happened. Uh, and if you, you get this level of temperature increase or acidification, these are the kinds of extinctions and changes to climate that actually may be. Whereas now I think every year, the, the, the quality of uh, uh, instrumentation, the kinds of ways that we measure stuff 
mass spectrometers, other ways of dating the rocks, of measuring the chemistry of the rocks, the computational tools that paleobiologists can use to estimate what's the rate of extinction, what, what's the speciation dynamics, what's actually going on in the communities and so on. Uh, all of that's improving. So I think actually we can now, there's a whole field called conservation paleobiology. Uh, and mainly there are people are looking at more recent stuff, you know, like the last two or three million years. But right. I think we can, we can look deeper and we can learn lessons. All right. So uh, on the acid rain thing, um, and the acidity in the water. Could you tell that? In uh, could are there telltale signs in the fossil record that you can see? Uh, increased acidity. Yeah. So they're actually hard to measure independently, but we can measure the um, uh, uh, the, the 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 environmental changes like temperature rise. Definitely, oxygen isotopes give you temperature rise. Acidification is usually measured by secondary characteristics. So normally to estimate the levels of acid rain and ocean acidification in the deep, in deep time, people are using kind of secondary evidence, but there are suggestions of geochemical tests that can get us towards that. And so I, I'm, very, I'm very interested in the fact that geochemists can use proxies for acidification. We know it's happened in historical time. There've been some great studies done where people have compared museum samples collected maybe a hundred years ago with present day samples from the ocean and you can see that the the micro the, the microorganisms the plankton or the mollusks they've changed the thickness of the shell so we can see within one species a hundred years you've got museum specimens we know where they came from they were sampled by uh, oceanographic expeditions a hundred years ago and you can go there to the same spot and sample today, and then you compare the samples. Uh, and we know, of course, for those spans of time, what the acidification has been, and we can actually see the effects on the, the ability of these organisms to build their shells. So we're, that's still something which the geochemists in deeper time need to give us more information about. All right, so we are, that is time. So. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Benton, and I want to thank the audience for tuning in today. Uh, and we'll talk soon, uh, hopefully with more interviews. Uh, and I'd love to do this again, Dr. Benton, if you are up for it. Um, we could well, do this course. again sometime. Happy to. Happy to. All right. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. See you soon.